Please record my name is Rick Helmuth. I rise on behalf of my client, Julie Kaufman, and we are before the court today with our appeal of the Wayne County Juvenile Court to the extent that Julie was denied an award of attorney fees and her request for attorney fees was denied by the Wayne County Juvenile Court in the current action in which she was sued by the Appley Mark Scheibe. Mr. Scheibe is also a cross appellant in this case. I'm going to submit my arguments on his appeal on my brief. If there, if uh, opposing counsel appears prior to the conclusion of my remarks, I will reserve a couple of minutes for rebuttal. We submit that Julie has been denied due process of law and equal protection of the law. The issue before the court is there a rational basis to make a distinction between parents who have never been married and parents who have been married in making an award of attorney fees in litigation involving the allocation of parental rights and responsibilities. Equal protection comes to us through the 5th and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution and a similar provision in the Ohio Constitution. And it's guaranteed, equal protection guarantees uh, that similar people are treated in a similar fashion. And as a result, there must be a rational relationship between the classification of persons and a legitimate government interest for a law to be constitutional. I emphasize to the court that we're not claiming that this denial of it, uh, equal protection is a fundamental right or that Julie is part of a suspect classification. That's why the uh, reasonable, uh, rational basis relationship test applies. Again, this is out of a parentage action initiated by Mr. Shabby of the Wayne County Juvenile Court back in 2015. And as the court is well aware, there's basically two things that have to be decided in the parentage case. Number one is who is the biological parent. Number two, what it should be the allocation of parental rights and responsibilities. That allocation of parental rights and responsibilities includes custody, what we now call residential parenting. It includes uh, which parent is to be the residential parent, whether or not the court should adopt a shared parenting plan, and if so, who should be the residential parent under that plan, what kind of visitation or companionship there should be for the non-residential parent or the parent with whom the uh, child does not primarily reside. In addition, the court is charged as part of its allocation of parental rights and responsibilities to make a determination of child support. In each and every one of these legal determinations, the court is required by reference of chapter 3111 to and by chapter 3109 or 4 to utilize the exact same statutes 
that are utilized by a divorce court in the allocation of parental rights and responsibilities. Whether we're talking about the custody, shared parenting, companionship, or visitation, whether we're talking about child support or its calculation, whether we're talking about child support enforcement, all of those things are pursuant to the exact same statutes. But the Ohio law, through the evolution of Ohio law, especially uh, after the adoption of 310573, has created two classifications of persons. In this case, two classifications of parents. One classification consists of parents who have never been married, such as Julie and Mark Shabby. The other classification of parents are parents who have been married or were previously married. Those parents who have been married, who are married or previously married, have their cases decided on allocation of parental rights and child support under the same statutes as Julie's case was decided. They have to go through the same procedures, the same hearings, and the same trials. But pursuant to Ohio Revised Code 3105.73, each parent is entitled to ask the, uh, the court to award them attorney fees. And in a divorce case, unlike a parent's case, the court can award those attorney fees based upon equitable considerations, including the relative income of the parties and the conduct of the parties. I went at some length in my brief on behalf of Julie to detail the per procedures that were pursued by Mr. Shad. The things that Julie was put through in defending this parentage action. The things she was put through uh, for the court to eventually decide after a three-day hearing that she should be the sole residential parent of the child. And that she should receive child support calculated on a very complicated business tax return and income of a man who had charged her with, uh, through the proceedings, uh, uh, with claiming she used drugs, demanding drug tests, requiring her guardian ad litem, which he later withdrew on a couple of occasions, filing motions for sanctions against her over discovery matters, when in fact, Julie was required to ask court to enforce discovery against Mr. Shaggy. Over three days of trial, the first of which was postponed for three months because his attorney on the day of trial withdrew from the case over disagreements with Mr. Shaggy and then later withdrew his withdrawal. But we filed three days of trial and over that three days of trial Mr. Shaggy called one witness and that was himself and he testified concerning the allocation of parental rights and responsibilities the support of a shared parenting plan, which he had requested, and which he testified, and I've cited the testimony in the record, that he hadn't even read the plan. He didn't know what its provisions were. Counsel, as regard to the constitutionality argument, is it that the is the argument that it's unconstitutional on its face by virtue of the language that may exclude unmarried parents, or is it it's unconstitutional as applied? by virtue of uh, the, uh, your client sitting in the same position that a previously married parent? Thank you, Your Honor. That's a very good question. And Chapter 3111 is the one that controls parentage actions. It has a provision of 3111.14 that allocates certain costs and the discretion of the court to allocate those costs. And it does not include in that attorney's fees. And in fact, none of the divorce statutes uh, include attorney fees either. It's this, this separate statute. It is our position that 3111, the parentage statute, is unconstitutional to the extent that it does not provide for the inclusion of attorney fees because of the classification that it creates of the unmarried or not previously married parent. So we are asking the court to reverse the Wayne County Juvenile Court on the basis that 3111 is unconstitutional in that it does not provide for the award of attorney fees for this classification of parents. Now, if the court is going to grant us relief, we believe
believe that the court will have to overturn this court's decision issued back in 1994 in Clark v. Joseph. Clark v. Joseph is a Ninth District Court of Appeals case, and I've cited it in my brief, where the court, where this court was faced with the proposition of whether or not there was a denial of equal protection in that, in the way the court viewed it at that time. A single woman did not have the opportunity to ask for attorney fees compared to a divorced parent. Back in 1994, the statute that applies to divorce cases was much different. The court went to lengths to emphasize in that case that an award of attorney fees in a divorce case was part of spousal support, or could be made part of spousal support, and that there were a number of factors, and if I recall correctly, I think there's at least 11 factors that figure into whether or not spousal support should be awarded in a divorce case, and therefore whether or not as a part of that spousal support, attorney fees should be included. But that's no longer the law. Eleven years after that case was decided, Ohio Revised Code 3105.73 was adopted. In 2005, that statute, which I, of course, have provided in its entirety for the court, has nothing to do with spousal support and is not dependent upon an award of spousal support as a condition as an award of attorney fees. In fact, that statute also applies to parents in post-divorce proceedings where spousal support would not even be involved. The court, in dealing with parents, whether during their original divorce or in subsequent post-divorce proceedings, when those parents are now perhaps single and for sure not married to each other, in those proceedings the court has the discretion, not the mandatory duty, but has the discretion to consider equities of whether or not attorney fees should be awarded. And when we think about it, even as a matter of public policy, we would think, we would hope that parents have a level playing field and that one parent cannot financially bully the other, as happened in this case, when at stake is the best interest of the child. Behind the statute that allows the award of attorney fees in divorce cases is the public policy that these parents should be on equal footing. It's expensive to litigate parentage cases. Guardian ad litem costs money. A psychologist costs money. A psychologist, by the way, that was requested by Mr. Shadd. A psychologist testifying costs money. Attorneys cost money. Julie testified at trial, and this trial, by the way, was a while ago. She testified at trial that her attorney fees and costs at that time were a little over $17,000. When the court made its determination of child support, it found, based upon the evidence and all the documentation, that she was earning $10 an hour. While Mr. Shadd's father had averaged over $230,000 per year for the last three years and over $300,000 during those first two years. Mr. Shadd, who owns airplanes, a restaurant, a business, several parcels of real estate, an airport. This is what he brought to the table. This is what he brought to bear on my client. We are here asking for equal protection. We are asking that parents of children be provided the same protection that the law provides parents of children that are married or were previously married. There is no rational basis any longer for distinction between these two classes of parents. As a result, without that rational 
basis. 3111, by not providing for an award of attorney fees, is unconstitutional. Counsel, um, I know you filed uh, an objection. You didn't just file one objection to the magistrate's decision, correct? That's correct. That's okay. the one before the court. Okay. And uh, what, what exactly did you raise? I was trying to find it, but I couldn't find it. What exactly was the nature of your objection? That the court uh, that the court committed an error for failing to award attorney fees. And the magistrate who made that decision uh, ruled that the absence of a statute of 3111 that provides for that, uh, therefore we weren't entitled to that. Yeah, I, I understand what the magistrate ruled. It's just the trial court just said, you know, objection overruled. So. Yeah. Uh, the trial judge overruled my objection. Uh, the trial court took it under consideration for a long time. The decision, I believe, was issued in, in June of, uh, of uh, 2017, and we got the final ruling on objections in January or February, I believe, 2018. Thank you, Thank you. Is there any more questions? If not, I'll sit down. Thank you. All right, thank you for your presentation. The court will take the matter under advisement, issue a written decision, which will be mailed to both sides as well as posted to our website and on the Ohio Supreme Court website. Court is recessed.